Adults, please turn to the book of Philemon. Philemon. Amen. What a beautiful little book Philemon is. Short but powerful. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, we're going to start reading there in verse 8. Philemon, verse 8. Hallelujah. The title of the message is, God's Got It Under Control. How many of y'all believe that today, that God has it under control? He does. He has it under control. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, beginning with verse 8. The Apostle Paul says this to Philemon, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that that which is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee, thee, I beseech thee excuse me, for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds who in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is my own heart, whom I would have retained with me, that in my stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willing. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou can't count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself." If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee anything, put that to my own account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own selves besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Verse 15 again. For perhaps he therefore departed... For a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing, God, to be upon the reading of your holy word. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Bible talks about here in verse uh, 15. It says, perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou should receive him forever. And of course, you know the background. He was a runaway slave. Amen. Amen. And while he ran away, he went over to Rome. The Bible says in verse 10, while he was there, the apostle Paul won him to God. So remember the background of the story is that Philemon is is the master and that Onesimus has run. He's a runaway slave. And the way the context reads, it seems as he robbed uh, Philemon as well. Now, when we look at it in the surface, it looks just like human events, right? It looks like we have a man named Onesimus, a runaway slave, just one day in his own human free will decided to run and to go to Rome. Amen. And probably robbed Philemon in the process out of a human decision. And then we see probably Philemon is, would be very upset about that on the human level because there's a human element to this story, amen. So Philemon would be upset, right? If you got robbed, maybe by a child, a runaway child. You walked into your safe one day and you opened the door of your house and walked in there and that safe was wide open and your child had robbed you and had run away. How would you feel? Well, you would be hurt and you would be very, probably very angry about that, would you not? So we see a human element, a human thread in this story here of a man making a decision to run away and and robbing his master. And then Philemon having to deal with that tension of all of these events. And then we have his wife, Aphia. No doubt she's all upset and she's hurt 
over the situation because the slave is gone and obviously they wanted him to be one to Christ, but it hasn't happened. So there's a lot of, it seem to be really bad events that are taking place around this little story, okay? Philemon being angry, Onesimus being a runaway slave, Aphia being hurt, etc. It's all there. It's, it's just a part of life. Amen. Amen. So when you look at it on the surface, it, it looks all human, right? But God had it under control. Because underneath all of those events, the Bible tells us in verse 15, that perhaps he therefore departed for a season or literally was separated from you. When you look at the commentaries like ICC commentary, you will see that that's the way it should be worded, separated. So that there's a third party in the picture. You don't see that when you read the story, but there's a third party in the picture, and that is God. That God literally was actively involved in the separating of Onesimus from his master. So whenever Onesimus was making those decisions out of human free will, they were real. Okay? When he ran, it was real. It was his decision to do that. It was wrong. He should not have done that. But the Bible tells us that there was a third party involved with it. As we look at the events in life, sometimes we just look at it on a human level, a surface level, and we don't really see deeper or below the surface of what is going on. All we see is human will, people doing certain things, etc., in many cases wrong and, uh, you know, evil. But we don't understand oftentimes that below that surface is that God is actively involved. Amen. And I'm glad today that God is in control. Because I would not want to live in a world where God wasn't in control. Can you imagine how crazy it would be if God wasn't in control? Do you realize that there's, you know, just the flapping of the wings of a butterfly in China can affect the complex weather system of the world. So if the, if the butterfly, it's called the butterfly effects. If the butterfly flaps its wings in China, there can be a rainstorm caused by that. In Oklahoma within a few weeks because of the complex systems of the universe okay amen think about your own life and I think about sister Christine a lot long ago having a wreck think about that if she had waited just a few seconds from where she left if she had just waited a few seconds she wouldn't have entered into that wreck amen but because she left when she did she was in a wreck and it was a very serious wreck. She got side, you know, sideswiped. And it, I mean, it caved the whole car in. It totaled the, totaled the vehicle. But God was in control. Amen. So there was human, human will involved with it. That very little subtle decision, you know, to get in the car at the time that she did. To drive down the roads that she drove. The speed that she drove down those roads. And the way she made the turn and the timing of that car, when he left his destiny, where he, when he left his whatever, you know, and the speed he was traveling and converged at that same time. All of those little, what you might think, insignificant events, you know. What if he hadn't left when he left? What if she hadn't left when she left? And all these things converge, you know, like the butterfly effect. These little, in, what you might think, insignificant events converge on a big deal. I used to tell my children all the time this right now. Little mistakes can become huge problems. And I told them, remember this little decisions that you make in life can have huge consequences. So be careful about the decisions that you make in life. Even though they may be small, small mistakes or, or what you might call small decisions... They can create big problems for you in life. So be careful. But the good news is this. In, even though there is human will and the freedom of human will to do and to go basically what, where you want to go or what you want to do in life, that God is in control. Because even though my wife decided to get in her car that night and drive home at that particular time, and that other car decided to get in his car and drive at that particular time, and they converged in a collision, that was all choice. It was free will. God didn't step in. He didn't try to stop it. Amen. But he was still in control. You say, well, if God was in control, why didn't he stop it? 
because he doesn't work that way. He can, but he doesn't work that way all the time. But I, can, I know this, that God was in control when I saw the wreck. She was hit on the passenger side of the car. And as she was turning like this, the, the car T-boned her. And when that car hit that side of the Jeep, it lifted, literally lifted the passenger seat up off the floor. And it made a cushion for her. Okay? So you can imagine this impact like this, right? So she's going to go this way because of the force. And so the seat got lifted up and she went this way. And that seat protected her. Amen? And it's just things just like that. I mean, it was like the seat was perfectly positioned so that she didn't have some major, major problem. Amen? And she was able to get out of that car on her own. And we didn't even take her to the hospital. She walked away from her car being completely totaled. Amen. So I know God was in control. And I personally believe that God sent his angel there. When that impact happened to, to save my wife's life. My wife could be dead today. Literally. And some of you have seen the picture. My wife could be dead today. If God had not intervened, I believe, with his angel. Praise God. And so there's human will that's involved in things. There are things that go wrong. There are things that, that happen that are, that are not good, that are evil, etc. But God's got it under control. Amen. When you study the Bible, this is a, a doctrine, it's a teaching in the Bible that's, to me, very complex. It's sometimes hard for me to wrap my mind around. But there's one view of God being control, and one of them is absolute control. Is that God is in absolute control of everything. That He plans everything, and He is in absolute control of everything. That means He's even in control of, for example, when my wife decided to get in the car and drive home that night, He was in control of even the impulse Okay, you with me? In her to get in the car to drive at that time. Amen. That's absolute control. That's a Calvinistic viewpoint, okay? And the, the, the fact that uh, they believe that God, is, God plans all things and that God is in absolute control, that there's absolutely nothing that happens that God is not originating. Now think about that. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that one. Amen. Is, is God behind somebody murdering somebody else? No. If it's absolute control that God is, you know, he's behind everything. He's uh, planned everything and he's controlling everything. Even the fact that, you know, somebody would kill somebody else. If that's the case, then God is the one who was the source of the evil. So I do not believe that God is in absolute control. I believe that he plans all things, but I don't believe he's in absolute control. That might shock you. I believe that God is in partial, partial control. Amen? And when I say partial control, that's the Ar Armenian viewpoint. And partial control is this. It believes that God plans everything, but he's in control over some. Now, the Armenian view is that God plans everything and God is in control of some, makes room for human free will. The Calvinistic viewpoint of God being in control, absolute control, doesn't leave room for human free will. That God is the one who inspired it, He originated everything that happens and everything that people do, they don't even really, they don't realize it, but they don't even have a choice in the matter. So that even if you walked into an ice cream shop and that day you decided, I want Rocky Road. Okay? You with me? That means when you chose Rocky Road, you could not choose any other thing but Rocky Road because God was in control about what kind of ice cream you were going to take that day. Amen? So you see the problem with that, right? Because it removes your ability to make decisions and choices and have a free will in your life. So don't, don't look at it like God is in absolute control that everything that you think and everything that you do and all the decisions in your life is because God is the one who initiated all of that. He allows human free will 
in our life. He allows human free will in the world. So that means he's in control of some things because men take his control away by making their own decisions. Is everybody with me here today? Okay, say praise the Lord. So it's a very complex thing. So I, I personally don't believe now, if you, if you believe in absolute control, that God plans all things, he's in control of everything, that there is no room for human choice at all, that it's all, it's all coming from God, then that's fine, okay? But I don't believe that. I believe that God plans all things, but I believe that God is in partial control. That means that there are times that the will of God is not done. Amen? How many of y'all understand that? There's times when the will of God is not done. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. That's His will, right? But is that the case? No, we know there's going to be some people that are not going to be saved, even though it's not God's will for them to perish. Why won't they be saved? Because they have the ability to make their own choices in life. So when God created you, he created you with a free will that you can exercise by choice to either be in his will or to be out of his will. Amen. So he's partially in control, but he plans all things. Amen. Now, just to look, give you a few ideas of what we're talking about here. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Amen. And I can make decisions in my life today that will take me completely out of the will of God. And it will have huge consequences. I can choose to stay in the will of God, the plan of God. Amen. As well. All right, look over to the book of Genesis chapter 50. And I'm bringing this to your attention because some people say, well, why did this happen? You know, why did God let this happen? Why does he allow evil in the world, you know? Why didn't God stop that murder? Why didn't God stop that, you know, that suicide? Why didn't God stop somebody from running away? Why didn't God intervene and do that? Amen. Because he's not. Absolutely, totally in control. Because when he created man, he put man on this earth and, and he gave man dominion over this planet. That means man is in partnership with God. Are you awake? Amen. Amen. All right, let's go over to Genesis very quickly. Chapter 50, verse 20. Remember what uh, happened to Joseph? All right. Just to lay a little foundation here for you before we look at how this applies to Philemon. Okay. Amen. All right. The Bible tells us here in verse 20, Joseph says, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save many people alive. You understand that? Okay, so we have two plans here. We have the plan of his brothers and the plan of his brothers. The intention of their plan was for what? Evil. But God was still in control. So that even though the plan of his brothers was evil, the plan of God was not evil. That God was actually involved in working through an evil design to bring about His good purpose. Is everybody with me here? So that God is in control. Even though you have human will working here that's an evil intention, God is still in control. He can step in to an evil situation and turn it around for the good. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is in control. Hallelujah. See, we don't live in a dualistic world or dualistic universe, which means we've got two gods. One bad one and one good one. And let the best one win. We don't believe that. God is in control. 
The devil is not God. He's not a God. God even controls what the devil does. And we know that by the book of Job. Amen? That the devil had to get a, a permission from God to do anything. So God can work through evil designs. See, the plan has a different intention with man. But God has another intention in his plan. And he can work through those evil situations and bring something good about out of it. And when the devil was trying to destroy Job, he had to get permission from God. And God gave him the permission. But in the end, God worked it for the good. Praise the Lord. That's where you and I have to trust God. That when things are not going well and things seem to be like, well, this is wrong. This is bad. It is. But God is still under control. And he can take even evil situation and turn it around for the good. Praise God. Amen. I believe that today and I thank God for that. All right. So in Joseph's case, they have an evil intention. But God's plan was that good would come out of that because God is in control. All right. Let's go over to the word of God in, in Psalm 96 and verse 10. Psalm 96, verse 10, God says, tell the nation something. What does he want the nations to know? They think they're in control. Amen. God says, you tell the nations something. He says, say among the nations that the Lord reigneth. The Lord reigns. He's in control. He is the sovereign Lord. That means he's in control. Amen. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. God is in control. Jesus said all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. That means he has power over all the spirit world. And he has power over all the things that go on in this world. God's got it under control. The problem is, is the human will sometimes doesn't line up with God. But God still got it under control. Amen. Whenever Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity, who was responsible for that? Was Babylon responsible for that? Well, in one sense they were. They were a player in it, right? They took Israel captive. Did you know that God did it? Look at Daniel chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 2, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. The Bible says that God delivered Israel into Babylonian captivity. If you're just looking at it from a human perspective, you would think, well, the, the enemy came in, Babylon came in and took him captive. And you completely leave God out. But the Bible says God is the one who did it. Question for you before we go over there and read this. Who was it that enticed David to number the people of Israel? Was it God or was it the devil? 